Listen, bro, the Jarek Trap might be one of my top five fave Rick and Morty adventures of all time. No disrespect to last week's premiere episode, but episode two actually felt way more like a season kickoff to me. Although it was kinda light on the Easter eggs this time around, it went heavy on the character analysis, killer voice acting, and father-son-in-law bonding. You're watching Whitney Vision, and today I'm breaking down all the details you might have missed in season two, episode seven of Rick and Morty. This is your spoiler warning! If you haven't seen the Jarek Trap yet, hit pause on this video and come back once you've disentangled your brain matter from your most annoying family members. While I have your attention, please check out my new podcast with Tommy Bechtold and MT, Guardians of the Galaxy. We release new episodes at the beginning of every week, so hit that notification bell after you subscribe so that you don't miss out. Now back to Rick and Morty. This week's episode title, The Jarek Trap, is obviously a play on The Parent Trap. Originally starring Haley Mills and Haley Mills, and later Lindsay Lohan and Lindsay Lohan, this summer camp classic tells the story of twin girls separated at birth who switch places in order to get their parents to fall in love again. Like Nick Parker and Elizabeth James from the 1998 version, Rick and Jerry learn to love the parts of each other that they once thought were annoying. Overall, this episode really encapsulates the high-concept adventure of earlier Rick and Morty episodes and highlights the show's strengths at deconstructing story tropes. The story structure this week follows that of not just a body swap film, but a majority of buddy movies where two contrasting protagonists slowly realize that they have more in common than they think and start to rub off on each other. In this case, we get to witness a literal translation of this concept. The episode opens with Jerry walking into the garage and picking up Rick's spaghetti strainer helmet. Although this item was first seen all the way back in season one's Me Seeks and Destroy, and several other episodes throughout the series, this is the first time its purpose is actually confirmed. Most fans have been split on whether it's a reference to Doc Brown's mind-reading helmet from Back to the Future or the Keymaster helmet that Lewis Tully wears in Ghostbusters. But today, we learn that this little baby is actually a mind-swapping device. I love that even though Rick is tinkering around underneath his spaceship, he has a sixth sense for when Jerry starts messing with his stuff. When Jerry approaches Rick with a problem, Gene has allegedly stolen his rake, Rick slides a handgun towards his son-in-law, insinuating that Jerry murder him over a gardening tool. I only mention this detail because I think that this might be the quickest example of a Chekhov's gun that I've personally ever seen. Rick and Jerry get into a heated debate about their brain capabilities. While Jerry argues that Rick was born with a smart brain and needs to check his brain privilege, Rick insists that he was born shit in his pants like every other baby and that he earned his genius by working hard. To force Jerry to admit that genius isn't random, Rick decides to swap his mind into Jerry's brain and vice versa. Rick explains that the brain is the hardware that he's gonna upload the software of the mind to, which is different than pulling a Freaky Friday because a Freaky Friday involves swapping bodies instead of uploading the mind into the other's brain specifically. Unfortunately, less than five seconds into living inside Jerry's brain, Rick's mind is so overwhelmed that he immediately finds the gun he passed to Jerry a few moments ago and turns it on himself. To be fair, Jerry's mind technically lasted longer in Rick's body. It takes him closer to 30 seconds to accidentally kill himself with Rick's cybernetic enhancements. First, Rick's multi-purpose tool pops out of his fingertip, followed by the blaster in his forearm and his activated rocket boots. Side quest, I gotta hand it to Ian Cardoni for this episode. Not only is he doing a Rick impression, he's actually doing an impression of Rick as partially Jerry. He perfectly balanced the vibe and voices of both characters in every scene, and I'm super impressed. With both of them dead, Rick's garage AI alerts that there's been a medical emergency and begins the tedious process of separating their minds from the brain matter trunks spewed across the room. When they wake up, there's only a few scars on their heads to mark their deaths, showing us just how much Rick has upgraded his resurrection process. All the way back in season two's Big Trouble in Little Sanchez, Rick makes his first attempt at transferring his mind to an alternate body with Tiny Rick. At the end of the episode, however, he deems the experiment a failure, as he wasn't able to keep his own mind in Tiny Rick's body. In season four's Edge of Timorty, Rick Die, Rick Pete, we officially learned about Operation Phoenix, Rick's failsafe plan for transferring his consciousness to an alternate body in case of death when Rick's backup clone bodies were revealed. We see an upgraded version of Operation Phoenix in season five's Rick Mirai Jack, when Rick's and Morty's are trying to flee the Citadel during evil President Morty's takedown. Instead of only having Rick clone bodies to transfer to, there's also Morty transfer clones as well. But after several of them got hacked up by blender blades, courtesy 
legacy of evil Morty's kill traps, Rick clearly did away with hiding backup clones in every multiverse. Now, his garage AI is fully capable of putting a smashed brain back together and bringing him and his son-in-law back to life within a matter of hours. And although their designs are different, it appears that Rick has implemented some of the tech from Morty's mind blower helmet into these mind swap spaghetti strainer helmets. Peep the neon juice in those tubes. It looks very similar to Mind Blower Memory Juice. Rick and Jerry wake up from their untimely deaths with pieces of each other's brains and minds in both of their bodies. Although the subtitles here start referring to the person speaking as either Rick body or Jerry body, I'm just gonna call their new hybrid forms Burger and Fries because it's a tiny bit less wordy. Fries tells Burger that he doesn't trust his fritzing R2-D2 body when several cybernetic enhancements pop out, including Rick's robot eye and bicep egg beater. But while these dudes are arguing over their blended brain holes, Morty has been taken prisoner in Crime Town by an alien called Chuxley's gang. When his mobsters frog march Morty into his office, Chuxley absolutely freaks out because he's terrified that Rick will show up and turn him into a sandwich as punishment for kidnapping his grandson. It turns out that Morty is dealing green crystals, known as croutons on the streets, to the citizens of Crime Town, and apparently, he's come a long way from the days when he was horrified at the idea of stealing Calaxian crystals for Rick in the season one finale. When Chuxley calls to smooth the situation over, both Burger and Fries instantly leap to Morty's rescue. Although Fries wants to run in their guns blazing, Burger believes that they need to keep mind effing with the mob, scaring them like Liam Neeson and Taken to maintain that healthy dose of fear between them. Interestingly, this is the beginning of a pattern where we see Burger act as more of a careful caretaker than Fries, going for the protector route instead of solely recklessly fighting. The boys fix their hair to look more like themselves, and I love that they both gain Rick's bald spot at the backs of their heads. Not only to show us how much they've become a part of each other, but also because that's one of the places where Garage had to stitch them back up. Fries grabs one of Burger's lab coats from the closet, and away they go! When Rick's ship tells Burger and Fries that she'll kill them both if they don't figure out how to drive together, Rick asks, Ugh, what are we, a 1930s comedy act? Referencing Laurel and Hardy's comedy flick, The Flying Deuces, where both men drive a plane with two separate steering wheels. As they attempt to rescue Morty, we once again see Fry's cool guy aggression and Burger's desire to think things through and follow a formula for fighting mobsters. Burger even pushes Fry's and Morty out the window to protect them. Actually, Morty is the one completely unfazed by the situation. When his dad and grandpa crash through Chuxley's office, he barely even moves out of the way because he's so used to these types of rescues. Although, it is pretty funny that Morty still won't listen to his dad's body, even with parts of Rick inside. During a classic mobster restaurant shootout, Morty asks, am I really gonna die because you botched a Freaky Friday? A reference to the body swap franchise that started in the 1970s and ultimately led to one of Lindsay Lohan and Jamie Lee Curtis's best performances. When Rick fails to use his cybernetic enhancements on the gangsters, he accidentally turns himself into a conehead, aka one of the characters from an SNL sketch that became a 90s comedy of the same name. Both Burger and Fries realize that they share a main goal besides their love of Dan Aykroyd and Coneheads to save Morty from harm. During the production teams inside the episode, Dan Harmon says, quote, there's a Buddhist saying, all suffering stems from the illusion that we are different people. Those guys are getting a taste of being past that illusion. As the white stripes we are gonna be friends begins to play, the two of them engage in a shootout, killing most of the gangsters in the bar. Once again, we see Burger dive on top of Fry's body to save him, proving that he's becoming the protector of the duo. Fry's activates Burger's rocket boots with a fork and sends his cone head barreling through Chuxley's torso. After stopping at every fast food restaurant in the galaxy, Burger and Fries return home to craft a super stacked hamburger with every patty from every universe. Based on the logos on these bags, I'd say they went to Intergalactic McDonald's, Arby's, Sonic, and Burger King. As both of them stack the best parts from each burger in sync to form the perfect meal, it's clear that this is a metaphor for the mixing of their own ingredients to form a better version of themselves. Burger asks Fries if he's going for the electro pneumatic diodes for their rebuild of mind swap helmets. Diodes are a semiconductor device that allows a current to flow in one direction, with resistance towards the opposite direction. This tells me that Fries is building a one-way current that will open up the pipes in both of their memories, allowing them to swap back without the risk of some of their characteristics backtracking into their brains. The two excitedly find Jerry's rake in Jean's garage, but both Burger and Fries realize that even though it's rad as hell to spy on the neighbors with thermonuclear binoculars, they really just want to live and let live. 
In the past, neither Jerry nor Rick would have been able to pass up the opportunity to mess with Gene for his petty slight against them. But now, they're actively making healthier choices with the best of both of their personalities and morals. It turns out that Burger and Fries are actually the best versions of Rick and Jerry, and they decide to run away together so that they won't lose their friendship. Burger and Fries leave a note for their family, which is more of a Jerry move, most recently seen in last season's Night Family, when he becomes pen pals with his night person and ultimately saves the day because of their letter-writing friendship. They wind up on a planet shaped like a gun pointing at another planet, running through the city in Miami Vice-esque Hawaiian shirts for their 24th Crystal Heist in 24 hours. You can really see Jerry's influence on burger and fries in these scenes, from their clothing to their fence-climbing farts to their Jimmy Buffett-inspired pina colada robot. Note that the pair seem to really enjoy burger's butt, a little foreshadowing to how they assemble Jericky later in the episode. Burger is shot while placing their calling card, a grody hamburger, into the mouth of their victim, proving that Rick's hyper-awareness of his surroundings have left the building. Fries laughs and says that one of them always gets shot, and it's true. In season three's Whirly Durly conspiracy, Rick gets both harpooned and poked with a medical shot, and in last season's final desmithination, Rick gets shot but has fortune cookie immunity. While flying their new houseboat ship, made up of an older wooden house smashed together with a sleeker, more modern one, representing the duality of their personalities, both dudes do a Howard Dean scream, a reference to the horrific noise that escaped a presidential candidate's maw back in 2004. <laughs> This dude actually completely botched his campaign because no one could stop making fun of him long enough to care about his politics. Beth, Morty, and Summer make it to the gun planet, but are quickly captured by Trexley and his mob. Surprise, he's still alive after getting shish kebobbed by Burgers' conehead, and is left with a gaping hole in his stomach. I'm not sure if this is an actual reference or not, but it reminded me a lot of when Junior shoots Tony in the tummy on The Sopranos. That bullet hole was a lot smaller, so maybe I'm stretching this Easter egg a little too far, but work with me, people. We're on a crime spree. Also, check out Tony's laundromat. That could be a nod to fictional mobsters Tony Soprano or Tony Montana. After a shootout in the bayou on swamp boats, Burger and Fries race to rescue their family at Chuxley's highly flammable oil tank room. In order to save Morty, Summer, and Beth, Burger and Fries sacrifice their individual bodies to form a human centipede-esque creature with two heads, two torsos, one perfect butt, and two sets of limbs attached to their melded minds. Like the burgers earlier, this new being, Jericki, smashes together all the best parts of themselves to create a super dad grandpa hybrid. Looks like all that blood sport training Jerry's been doing in the season's intro has been getting his six pack shredded. My favorite part of their mob battle is when they do a tandem exorcist crawl across the ceiling with their weird little grasshopper arms and legs. I also love that they definitely do some Donkey Kong barrel rolls to get rid of their enemies. As he dies eating one of Jarecki's leftover hamburgers from their burger and fries spree, Chuxley admitted that Rick was right earlier. He just wanted to see if he could kill God. This time, when they fly back home, Jericki uses all four of his limbs to steer both steering wheels at the same time, finally working together in their Laurel and Hardy-ass spaceship. But Jericki might be too intertwined. Jericki tells their family that they're leaving, and Summer asks if it's gonna be like the crow thing from season 5's Forgetting Sarah Murchill and Rick Mariah Jack, when Rick abandoned his family to become a master of crows. Although they claim that Gene returning Jerry's rake won't change their shuffled mind, the rake boinks them in the noggins, and their individual personalities return. As their family tries to hold down their double body, Rick screams that memory Rick is still in there. This 30-year-old version of Rick was also introduced in Season 5 during the events of Rick Turnell Friendshine of the Spotless Mort, when he infiltrates Bird Person's memories. After surviving that ordeal, Rick allows memory Rick to live inside his mind, where apparently he still remains. Rick and Jerry are back to bickering, but it's easy for the whole family to see that these two actually love each other a lot more than they let on. As We Are Gonna Be Friends starts to play again, we get a bird's eye view of the Smith's house, including the outlines of Beth, Jerry, Morty, Summer, Rick, and Space Beth's graves. Next, we see a Polaroid of burger and fries that tells us they're banned from a bar, likely because they never settled up on the thousands of dollars of bar tabs they racked up together. The post credit scene catches us up with Memory Rick, who's been trying in vain 
plane to escape from Jerry's brain chunks. We even see a young Jerry on a field trip to visit the USS spaceship. Although, it turns out that Jerry's only technological knowledge involves seeing springs and gears as their only inner workings. It actually kind of reminded me of that scene in Alice in Wonderland when the Mad Hatter makes a jam snack out of the March Hare's busted pocket watches, springs, and gears. Most interesting to me, however, is that Memory Rick is unsure if R. Rick did this by accident or purposely and maliciously locked them inside Jerry as some sort of punishment. Remember earlier in the episode when Rick says to Jerry, so that's where my paranoia went? It turns out he wasn't kidding. Memory Rick seems to harbor Rick's paranoia that someone is always out to get him, and I'd love to see a mind battle between the two when Memory Rick decides to enact his revenge. These are just some of the details that I noticed in the Jerick trap, but I want to know what I missed in the comments. Like and subscribe to Whitney Vision, and be sure to check out my new podcast with Tommy and MT, Guardians of the Palaxy. I'll be back next week with another breakdown of Season 7, Episode 3, Air Force One. I'm Scarlet Witt, and you're watching Whitney Vision.